imagine being 12 and having the power just to take anybody off your, your video game. The FBI has been keeping a fugitive list since the spring of 1950. Most people who make this list are adults deemed dangerous to society. Surprisingly, some children have also made this list, from kids who hacked into big game companies every single big company. to young outlaws of the Gilded Age. Join me in this video as I take you through FBI's most wanted kids. Eric Taylor. Eric Taylor's life of crime began in the quiet suburban neighborhood of Long Beach, California. Eric Taylor, an unassuming teenager, discovered his extraordinary talent for hacking at the tender age of 12. His journey into the world of cybercrime started innocently enough as he sought to gain an edge in online video games. Just imagine being 12 and having the power just to take anybody off your, your video game. <laughs> Little did he know that this seemingly harmless pursuit would catalyze his meteoric rise to infamy. As Taylor's skills grew, he caught the attention of a group of hackers who saw his potential and welcomed him into their ranks. In 2012, Taylor and his group set their sights on a target that would send shockwaves through the online world. Their aim? To bring down the social media giant, Twitter. With their combined expertise and relentless determination, Taylor's group successfully shut down Twitter for approximately an hour. Millions of users were left unable to tweet or browse their timelines as chaos ensued in the digital realm. But Taylor's ambitions didn't stop there. He and his group set their sights on even bigger fish, targeting high high-profile individuals and major corporations. Their hacking endeavors knew no bounds. Taylor says they also accessed customer account data at major corporations like Amazon, Apple, AT&T, and Netflix, sometimes gaining access to customers' personal info. While some companies remained tight-lipped about the breaches, others, like Amazon, acknowledged the seriousness of the situation. Taylor's group, however, had their sights set on more than just corporate targets. They aimed to expose the vulnerabilities of high-profile individuals, including celebrities, and politicians. Every day when I was publishing, uh, I would publish a new celebrity every day. I mean, when you can access the records of the President of the United States and all of their officials and celebrities and everything, it's, it's a lot of power that you feel and then you see it on the news the next day because you premeditated all of it. Taylor's actions sent shockwaves through the entertainment and political spheres. The media dubbed him Cosmo the God, a name that struck fear into the hearts of those who valued their privacy. But amidst the chaos and notoriety, one question remained. How did Taylor manage to obtain such sensitive information? The answer lay in a daring move that involved hacking into a Russian website that had already stolen the data. I don't like Russia, <laughs> but I had to talk to them to get in with them and it worked. Like I made the site seem like it came back to Russia and the media published it as Russian hackers. But I, I mean, I knew the FBI was going to catch up to me. And catch up they did. The FBI, relentless in their pursuit of justice, closed in on Eric Taylor. One fateful day, federal agents stormed into his bedroom, handcuffing him and putting an end to his hacking spree. Do you regret publishing that information? Yes, 100%. Getting my door kicked down and flashbang by over 30 to 40 Secret Service and FBI agents when I was 16. After pleading guilty to a string of high-profile computer crimes, Taylor walked away with probation. But this was not the end of his story. In fact, it was just the beginning of a new chapter in his life. Now 21 years old, Eric Taylor has turned his life around. He is no longer the teenage hacker who reveled in chaos and power. Instead, he has dedicated himself to the world of cybersecurity, using his knowledge and experience to help companies defend themselves from cyber criminals. Eric Taylor now joins a list of former hackers who have turned over a new leaf, like Kevin Mitnick, but the allure of his past will always linger as he watches from a distance the activities of his former hacker colleagues who have set their sights on cashing in on the world of cryptocurrency. Taylor's journey from hacker to advocate serves as a powerful reminder that change is possible even in the face of adversity. He joins the ranks of other former hackers who have turned over a new leaf, like Kevin Mitnick, using their knowledge and experience to protect and defend. But the world of cybersecurity is ever-evolving, and new challenges arise with each passing day. Taylor, now 21 years old, keeps a watchful eye on the activities of his former hacker colleagues who have set their sights on cashing in on the world of cryptocurrency. Colton Harris Moore. After two years on the run, the so-called barefoot bandit accused of robbing people in eight states and two other countries is in jail this morning in the Bahamas. In the quiet town of Mount Vernon, Washington, a young boy named Colton Harris Moore was destined for a life of chaos and crime. Born into a troubled family, Colton's childhood was far from ordinary. Growing up, Colton's father, Gordon, battled with drug addiction, spending time in prison before abandoning the family. Left in the care of his troubled mother, Colton faced a challenging environment 
that would shape his future. Neighbors and teachers began to notice that something was amiss. Colton's behavior was rebellious, and he often found himself in fights. He had a hard time following instructions and seemed to be on a path of self-destruction. Seeking solace in the surrounding woods, Colton found himself drawn to a life of solitude and survival. But it wasn't long before he discovered a more enticing target, the vacation homes near Mount Vernon. Breaking into these homes became a way for Colton to escape his troubled reality. He built a secret camp in the woods, relying on stolen supplies to survive. However, his criminal activities did not go unnoticed. The authorities caught up with him, and at a young age, Colton found himself facing the consequences of his actions. Arrested multiple times for possession of stolen property, Colton's criminal tendencies only grew stronger. He seemed to be on a path of self-destruction, with no regard for the law. Despite attempts to intervene and help him stay out of trouble, Colton's criminal behavior escalated. He began to engage in more serious crimes, including stealing a neighbor's camcorder. The authorities decided it was time for a more significant intervention. Colton was sentenced to a three-month term in a halfway house, hoping that it would set him on the right path. But Colton had other plans. In 2008, at the age of 17, he made a daring escape from the halfway house, disappearing back into the wild. Now, a fugitive, Colton was ready to take his criminal campaign to the next level. The Pacific Northwest would soon become his playground, and law enforcement would find themselves facing an unprecedented challenge. Colton's intimate knowledge of the area, acquired during his time slipping around the woods undetected, gave him a significant advantage. He had no qualms about breaking into countless houses, taking whatever he needed to survive. Sometimes his crimes were driven by simple pleasures. He would take baths in stolen homes or indulge in stolen ice cream. After all, even outlaws need their sweet treats. But Colton's taste grew more expensive over time. He stole credit cards and used them to order high-end equipment, such as night vision goggles and bear mace. He was fully prepared to navigate the Washington woods. However, it wasn't just cars and supplies that caught Colton's attention. He developed an obsession with aircraft, fueled by books and DVDs on flying small planes. Colton's audacity knew no bounds. He escalated his criminal activities by stealing privately owned planes, using them to make daring escapes and fly to safety. Not even celebrities were safe from his exploits. Colton infamously stole the Cessna, owned by rock radio personality and novelty musician Bob Rivers. The stolen plane was eventually discovered on a Yakama Indian reservation site hidden away on tribal land. But Colton's thirst for adventure and his taste for danger were far from quenched. What made Colton's crimes even more astonishing was the fact that he never resorted to violence. He never harmed anyone, never used weapons during his thefts. His focus was solely on obtaining the essentials and supplies he needed to survive. In fact, there were moments when Colton's softer side shone through. In 2010, a veterinary clinic south of Seattle received a surprising note from him expressing his desire to help care for the animals. It was signed with his self-proclaimed nickname, the Barefoot Bandit. But as Colton's crimes became bolder, his actions caught the attention of the federal government. The FBI and other agencies launched a concentrated effort to track him down, marking the first time he faced a concentrated law enforcement pursuit. In July 2010, a federal judge in Washington issued an extensive indictment against Colton. The charges included federal crimes related to his theft of a plane from Idaho, and a $10,000 bounty was placed on his head. The pursuit of Colton Harris Moore reached its climax when he attempted his most audacious escape yet. After stealing a Cessna 400 airplane from an Indiana airport, he crashed it in the waters near the Bahamas, leaving authorities wondering if he had survived. But the barefoot bandit wasn't done yet. He continued his crime spree in the Bahamas, committing a series of break-ins on Great Abaco Island. Local authorities were hot on his trail, closely monitoring the thefts and gathering crucial evidence. The chase came to a head when Colton tried to flee on a stolen boat. In a daring move, the police took aim and shot out the motor, leaving him stranded and surrounded. Faced with capture, Colton made a desperate move. He threw his computer into the water, ensuring that his secrets would sink to the depths of the sea. Then, he brandished a gun, ready to fight until the bitter end. In a tense standoff, the police managed to talk him out of harming himself. Colton was taken into custody, ending his reign as the barefoot bandit. Deported back to the United States after being charged for illegal entry into the Bahamas, Colton faced federal and local charges related to his extensive crime spree. Despite the severity of his crimes, the judge took into consideration Colton's troubled childhood and expressions of remorse. He was sentenced to seven years in prison, less than what the prosecutors had sought. However, the judge allowed his federal sentence to be served consecutively with his state prison sentence, ensuring that he would remain behind bars until his 20s were over. Determined to make the most of his time in prison, Colton embarked on a journey of self-improvement. He focused on studying aeronautical engineering, perhaps hoping to redeem himself through a legitimate career. The story of Colton Harris Moore drew comparisons to another notorious 
notorious outlaw, Frank Abagnale, who turned his life around after a life of crime. Could Colton follow a similar path? After serving less than five years of his seven-year sentence, Colton was released from custody in 2016. He entered a halfway house in Seattle, where he began the process of repaying the $129,000 he owed to his victims. While Colton's parole restrictions limited his travel and ambitions of flight school, his reputation remained sky-high. He gained a massive fan base with websites, books, and even documentaries dedicated to his story. Today, Colton Harris Moore is out of prison and has stayed out of trouble with the law. He has expressed a desire to pursue a career in public speaking, hoping to share his experiences and inspire others. David Pecora, Dylan Wheeler, and Anthony Clark. Are you Wait, have you been listening? I have to the Australian Department of Defense. <laughs> I have every single big company, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, any game company you can name, Google, Microsoft, Disney, Warner Brothers. Oh my god, Disney. Everything. Next, we delve into the dark and twisted tale of David Pecora, a notorious cyber criminal who caught the attention of the FBI. From hacking into game developers' networks to selling modified versions of popular games, David's criminal activities knew no bounds. But as we will soon discover, no one can outrun the long arm of the law. David's obsession with the inner workings of video games started innocently enough. He would spend hours dissecting game code, exploring the possibilities hidden within. But as his skills grew, so did his desire to push the boundaries of what was possible. It was in the confines of his dorm room that David's hacking journey truly began. Armed with his trusty computer and a thirst for knowledge, he started by hacking his own family's Xbox console. Little did he know that this seemingly innocent act would set in motion a series of events that would change his life forever. As David's hacking skills progressed, he found himself drawn to the vibrant community of Xbox hackers. It was at a gaming convention where he would meet his partner in crime, Anthony Clark. Together they formed a formidable duo, combining their skills and pushing the boundaries of what was possible in the gaming world. David and Anthony's collaboration was a match made in hacker heaven. They spent countless hours working side by side, modifying Halo games and creating special abilities for the characters. Their creations garnered praise from professional programmers, fueling David's desire to pursue a career in game development. But as David's hacking activities progressed, so did the allure of financial gain. The duo realized that their skills could be monetized and they set their sights on a new venture, selling modded versions of popular games. Their illegal enterprise proved to be a gold mine. Players were willing to pay top dollar for the opportunity to experience superpowers and abilities beyond their wildest dreams. The money started pouring in, and David and Anthony found themselves living a life of luxury, fueled by their illicit activities. But their hunger for power and money was insatiable. They knew they had to push the boundaries even further. And that's when they stumbled upon a vulnerability in the Xbox 360 console, a flaw that would give them an unprecedented advantage in their hacking endeavors. With their newfound knowledge, David and Anthony developed a program to bypass Microsoft's ban system. This meant that they could continue their hacking activities without fear of being caught. They were invincible, or so they thought. Little did they know that their actions had caught the attention of the authorities. The FBI had started to take notice of their cybercrime activities, and the net was closing in. But David and Anthony were not ready to give up their life of crime just yet. As we will soon discover, the consequences of their actions would be far-reaching. The story of David Pecora and his partnership with Anthony Clark is just the beginning of a tale that will leave you on the edge of your seat. Stay tuned as we delve deeper into the shocking world of Dylan Wheeler, the mastermind behind one of the most notorious cybercrime rings in history. As David and Anthony's hacking empire grew, so did their hunger for power and recognition. They wanted to leave a lasting mark on the gaming world, and their sights were set on a target that would send shockwaves through the industry. Game developer Epic Games. With their skills and knowledge, David and Anthony devised a plan to break into the network of Epic games. They knew that gaining access to this treasure trove of sensitive data would solidify their status as the ultimate hackers. But little did they know that their actions would trigger a federal investigation that would put their entire operation at risk. Armed with their hacking tools and a thirst for revenge, David and Anthony infiltrated the network of Epic Games. They navigated through layers of security, leaving no trace of their presence. Their goal was not only to steal valuable source code, but also to leak an unreleased game as an act of defiance against the game industry. The break-in was a success. David and Anthony gained access to sensitive data, including unreleased games and proprietary information. They reveled in their triumph, believing they were untouchable. But little did they know that their actions had caught the attention of the FBI, who were closing in on their every move. The FBI launched a full-scale investigation into the breach at Epic Games. They were determined to bring down the hackers responsible for this audacious act. But David and Anthony, fueled by their arrogance and desire for 
revenge, continued their hacking spree, unaware of the storm that was about to engulf them. As the investigation intensified, the FBI started to piece together the puzzle. They discovered the connection between David Pecora and his partner in crime, Dylan Wheeler. Dylan, a skilled hacker in his own right, had been operating in the shadows, orchestrating their cyber crime activities from behind the scenes. The FBI knew they had to act swiftly to bring down this cyber crime ring. They were closing in on David, Anthony, and the elusive Dylan Wheeler. But the question remained, would they be able to apprehend them before they could cause further damage? The stage was set for a dramatic showdown. The FBI, armed with evidence and determination, raided the hideout of David and Anthony. They were apprehended, their empire crumbling around them. But what about Dylan Wheeler? The mastermind behind it all remained at large, a shadow in the dark. The arrest of David and Anthony marked a turning point in the investigation. The FBI now had a clearer picture of the cybercrime ring and the role Dylan Wheeler played in it. The hunt for Dylan intensified as the authorities closed in on their most wanted criminal, Billy the Kid. Next, we delve into the dark and mysterious world of one of America's most notorious outlaws, Billy the Kid. But wait, you might be wondering, how can Billy the Kid be on the FBI Most Wanted Kids list when the FBI didn't even exist during his time? Well, let's find out. Billy the Kid, born as Henry McCarty in the late 1850s, had a childhood marred by hardship and tragedy. Growing up in the bustling streets of New York City, he found himself surrounded by poverty and crime. With his father's death at a young age and his mother struggling to make ends meet, Billy was left to fend for himself in a world that showed him little mercy. As a young boy, Billy was drawn to the allure of the streets, where he found solace among the gangs and pickpockets. He quickly learned the art of survival, honing his skills in petty theft and deception. But it was in these early years that the seeds of his criminal career were sown. Billy's crimes began innocently enough, with small acts of mischief and rebellion. He would steal apples from market stalls, pickpocket unsuspecting passers-by, and engage in street brawls with rival gangs. These acts may have seemed trivial at the time, but they were the first steps on a path that would lead him to infamy. As Billy grew older, his criminal activities escalated. He became involved in more serious offenses, such as burglary and armed robbery. His audacity and fearlessness earned him a reputation among the criminal underworld, and his name began to appear on wanted posters around the city. The authorities were determined to put an end to Billy's reign of terror, but he proved to be a slippery target. He had a knack for evading capture, using his knowledge of the city's back alleys and hidden passages to outsmart the police. Billy became a master of disguise, often changing his appearance to avoid detection. But it wasn't just his criminal activities that set Billy apart. He possessed a charisma and charm that drew people to him, even in the midst of his lawlessness. He had a way with words and a quick wit that made him both feared and admired. It was this combination of charm and ruthlessness that made him such a compelling figure. As Billy entered his teenage years, his crimes took a darker turn. He became involved in gang warfare, aligning himself with some of the most dangerous and notorious criminals of the time. Together, they wreaked havoc throughout the city, instilling fear in the hearts of both the innocent and the guilty. The authorities were desperate to bring Billy to justice, but he always seemed to be one step ahead. He would disappear into the shadows, leaving behind a trail of chaos and destruction. The city became a battleground, with law enforcement agencies vying for the honor of capturing the elusive outlaw. Despite his young age, Billy the Kid had become a symbol of rebellion and defiance against the establishment. His crimes shocked the community and captivated the imagination of the public. The legend of Billy the Kid was born, and his name would forever be etched in the annals of American history. The year was 1878, and the Wild West was a land of lawlessness and chaos. It was during this time that Billy the Kid found himself embroiled in one of the most notorious conflicts of the era, the Lincoln County War. This bloody feud would not only shape the course of Billy's criminal career, but also leave a lasting mark on the history of the American West. The Lincoln County War was a battle for control over the lucrative cattle industry in New Mexico. Two factions, led by James Dolan and John Tunstall, were locked in a bitter struggle for power and influence. Billy the Kid, always drawn to the allure of violence and adventure, found himself caught in the crossfire. John Tunstall, a wealthy Englishman, took Billy under his wing, recognizing the young outlaw's potential. He saw something in Billy that others had missed, a spark of intelligence and a thirst for justice. Tunstall became a mentor to Billy, teaching him the ways of the world and instilling in him a sense of loyalty and honor. But the peace would not last. Tunstall's murder 
Mercer at the hands of Dolan's men ignited a fire within Billy. He vowed to avenge his mentor's death, setting off a chain of events that would plunge the region into chaos. Billy assembled a gang of outlaws, known as the Regulators, and declared war on Dolan and his allies. The Lincoln County War became a blood-soaked battleground, with both sides resorting to violence and brutality. Billy the Kid, with his quick draw and fearless nature, became a key figure in the conflict. He led his gang on daring raids, targeting Dolan's men and striking fear into the hearts of their enemies. The Regulators fought with a ferocity and determination that shocked even the most hardened criminals. They were driven by a sense of justice and a desire to avenge the death of their fallen leader. But as the body count rose, the line between right and wrong became increasingly blurred. Billy the Kid's reputation as a ruthless outlaw grew with each passing day. His crimes included cattle rustling, horse theft, and even murder. He became a symbol of rebellion, a figurehead for those who felt oppressed by the corrupt forces that ruled the land. The authorities were desperate to bring him to justice, but Billy always seemed to be one step ahead. However, the tide would soon turn against Billy and his gang. In a fateful encounter, the regulators were ambushed by a posse led by Sheriff Pat Garrett. The battle was fierce, but the odds were stacked against Billy and his men. Many of the regulators were killed, and Billy himself was captured and thrown into jail. But Billy the Kid was not one to be held captive for long. In a daring escape, he killed two guards and made his way to freedom. The news of his escape spread like wildfire, and a nationwide manhunt was launched to capture the elusive outlaw. The hunt for Billy the Kid intensified, with law enforcement agencies across the country joining the search. Rewards were offered, and his face appeared on wanted posters from coast to coast. But Billy, with his cunning and resourcefulness, managed to evade capture time and time again. However, his luck would eventually run out. In July 1881, Sheriff Pat Garrett, the same man who had once pursued him, tracked Billy down to a remote hideout. In a dramatic shootout, Billy the Kid was fatally shot, bringing an end to his life of crime and violence. Craig Price in order to understand the chilling crimes committed by Craig Price, we must first explore the early years of his life. It was during this time that the seeds of darkness were sown, and the signs of aggression and cruelty began to emerge. Craig Price was born on October 11, 1973, in Warwick, Rhode Island. At first glance, his childhood appeared to be like any other. However, behind closed doors, a different story was unfolding. Growing up in a quiet suburban neighborhood, Craig seemed like an ordinary child, but those who knew him closely would soon discover a disturbing side to his personality. According to neighbors and childhood friends, Craig exhibited troubling behavior from an early age. He was known for his aggressive tendencies and a fascination with inflicting pain on others, especially animals. Animal cruelty became a recurring theme in Craig's childhood. There were reports of him torturing small creatures such as birds and squirrels, displaying a disturbing lack of empathy. Psychologists often point to animal cruelty as one of the early warning signs of a potential serial killer. It is believed that the ability to harm defense creatures without remorse can indicate a deep-seated darkness within. To understand the origins of Craig's aggression, we must also examine his family dynamics. While his parents appeared to be loving and supportive, there were underlying issues that may have contributed to his troubled psyche. Some family members revealed that Craig experienced a turbulent relationship with his father, who was known for his strict disciplinary measures. This strained relationship may have fueled Craig's anger and resentment, pushing him further down a dangerous path. As Craig entered his teenage years, his behavior became increasingly concerning. Teachers and classmates noticed a pattern of aggression and a lack of empathy. He was known for his violent outbursts and a disregard for authority. Former classmates and teachers recall instances where Craig would lash out at his peers, both verbally and physically. He seemed to take pleasure in causing pain and instilling fear in others. Craig's violent tendencies eventually caught the attention of law enforcement. He found himself in and out of the juvenile justice system. With multiple arrests for assault and other violent offenses, the signs were there, but no one could have predicted the extent of the darkness that lay within Craig Price. As he transitioned from troubled teenager to a full-fledged serial killer, the community would soon be gripped by fear and terror. The first victim, Joan Heaton, was a 39-year-old mother of two. On the night of July 27, 1987, she was brutally attacked in her own home. The savagery of the crime sent shockwaves through the neighborhood, leaving residents in a state of fear and disbelief. The murder of Joan Heaton was just the beginning. Over the course of the next two years, Craig Price would claim the lives of three more innocent victims. Each murder was marked by a level of brutality that defied comprehension. The second victim, Rebecca Spencer, was a 27-year-old woman who fell victim to Craig's insatiable bloodlust on December 31, 1987. Her life was tragically cut short, leaving her family and friends devastated. The impact of these murders on the community cannot be overstated. Fear gripped the hearts of Warwick residents as they grappled with the realization that a cold-blooded killer was among them. The community rallied together, attending 
candlelight vigils and organizing neighborhood watch groups in an attempt to protect themselves and their loved ones from the unknown menace lurking in their midst. Law enforcement agencies were under immense pressure to bring the killer to justice. The investigation into the murders was relentless, with detectives meticulously combing through evidence and interviewing potential witnesses. Despite the efforts of the police, Craig Price managed to evade capture for an extended period of time. His ability to blend in with the community and maintain a facade of normalcy made him an elusive and dangerous adversary. The media frenzy surrounding the case only intensified as the body count continued to rise. The public demanded answers, and the pressure on law enforcement to apprehend the killer reached unprecedented levels. Finally, on September 1, 1989, the reign of terror came to an end. Craig Price was apprehended, bringing a sense of relief and closure to a community that had been living in fear for far too long. That brings us to the end of this video. For more videos like this, click on the cards on your screen.